Thank you. I always wonder how I'm supposed to walk to a challenge slow clap. <laughs> like walk slow and then walk faster, faster, faster. All right. You guys are in a series that, as I understand it, it's broken to restored. It's about looking at what happens when your life is broken and how God wants to restore it. So what I want to do is I want to talk with you about John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, there is an encounter in which uh, Jesus meets a person, a man who was born blind. Now, it's referred to, if you have your Bible, if you look at it later, it's referred to as Jesus and the blind man. But actually, it's a story that involves multiple characters. It involves Jesus. It involves the blind man. It involves the disciples. It involves the townspeople. And it involves the Pharisees. So there's a big cast in this story. And there's also a big cast of the themes that Jesus addresses in it. He's dealing with different issues. Issues like physical blindness, spiritual blindness, deception, manipulation, responsibility, discouragement. He's dealing with a lot of the things that we deal with, that we face, that we have to get a handle on. Maybe there are areas where, where we have been broken and we need to be restored. And, and one right up front fact is Jesus is the only one who has the power to restore you. He can do that. So what Jesus is doing here is he, he's helping us get a handle on the hard situations that we face, on the hard circumstances. He's helping us to figure out how life works and to live accordingly. See, Jesus came to help people, to change lives. He came to give freedom to people who felt like they were trapped. He came to give forgiveness to those who felt guilty. He came to give a future to those who felt hopeless. So he comes to meet us wherever we are. Now, in this instance, in this chapter, Jesus has this encounter with this blind man. And it's a pretty fascinating, pretty interesting story. Um, it really is a story about how Jesus can bring light into your darkness, into that area where you may feel damaged or hurt or broken. It really does reveal what Jesus can do. So this is the story of a man who was actually born blind. All of his life he suffered from physical darkness, from an inability to see. Then Jesus steps into his life and he helps him. He helps him to see physically, but also, and even more importantly, he helps him to see spiritually. He enlightens him. He opens his eyes. So in the first few verses of John chapter 9... Jesus heals his physical blindness. I mean, in the first few verses. But then he takes the rest of the chapter to do something even far more important. He heals his spiritual blindness. So this really is the story of how God can help you see things that you've never seen before. It's a story about how to handle the hard situations, the hard circumstances, the hard struggles that you experience in life. It's a story about how Jesus meets us where we are and he restores us. He brings life back up into our life when we have felt like it was diminished or damaged. So what I want to do, walking through the story, I'm going to give you four things that I think you could learn from this story. There's more things there, but I'm just going to point out four of those. So whenever you're facing a struggle, the first thing you need to do is ask the right questions. Too many people, too many times, they're asking the wrong questions. And so the answers they get don't really apply to the situation because they're not asking the right questions. In verse 2, Jesus' disciples walked by this man that was born blind, and they looked to Jesus and they asked him a question. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? That's the wrong question. That's, that's only looking at a situation with only two options. Either this man sinned or his parents sinned. Jesus, which one was it? 
there's a problem there. And the problem is whenever you enter a situation with either or thinking, you're not going to get the right answers. Whenever you think it's either this or this, there might be a, a half a dozen other options in the equation. So whenever you have either or thinking, you get trapped in it. You get stuck in it. You're, you're taking the wrong angle of approach. So look at what Jesus had to say to their question. In verse 3, he says, you're asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame. There's no such cause effect here. Look instead for what God can do. Rather than looking at this or this, looking for someone to blame, look to God and to see what God could do in the situation. They weren't considering all the options. See, some people don't gain the understanding that they need in a situation because they're stuck in either or thinking. Some people don't gain the understanding they need because they're stuck in preconceived ideas. They've entered into the situation with a preconceived idea or a preconceived agenda, so they're not open to options. They're not open to what God could do. When I look at this story and read this story, it identifies one blind man. But I think there are a lot of blind people in the bunch. He's not the only one. Jesus is looking at this blind man and at his disciples, and he sees the man's physical blindness, but he also sees a spiritual blindness. And then the really cool thing is he decides to take action. He decides to do something about it. He takes action and he invites the man to take action with him. He doesn't just leave him sitting there and move on and talk about things. He takes action. So the first thing, when you're facing a hard situation, when you're, when you're wondering what is going on and why is this happening, you need to ask the right questions. The second thing you do is based on the truth you gain from the right questions, getting the right answers, you take steps of obedience. You take the steps of obedience and you do the things that Jesus lays out to do. If Jesus says to do something, it's not the time to think about it, to ponder it, to wonder if it's something you should do. If Jesus said it, yes, you should do it. In verse 7, Jesus told the man, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went, washed, and came back seeing. The thing that amazes me about this verse is what the man did in the middle of it. Right between Jesus saying, go and wash, and then the man came back seeing, that's where the fascinating part of it is. Because what Jesus said was, go and wash. The man went, and then he comes back and he can see. I also think of that, and I wonder how much the man thought about it before he took his first steps, before he thought to himself, I've done that a thousand times. I've been in that pool, washing my eyes over and over and over again, wanting to be healed, but never being healed. So now you're saying, go and wash. Well, okay, it's you, Jesus. I'll do it. And so he goes down and he washes his eyes and he comes back and his blindness is gone. He can see. That, that's fascinating to me because the thing that the man did was obedience. Jesus told him to do something. Go and wash in the pool. And the guy gets up and he goes. And he's blind. And so he doesn't know who's in his way, what obstacles are there. He has to work his way down to the pool, wash his eyes, and then he comes back seeing. See, that's when the amazing thing happens. The amazing thing happens when somebody takes a step of obedience. When some truth is revealed because they asked the right question, and then they take a step of obedience because of it. God says, do this. You do it, and something significant happens. And I think it's interesting to think of the things that were said, the things that God said to someone or Jesus said to someone, how simple they were, and yet how profound the outcome was because somebody obeyed. 
God wanted to split the Red Sea into two. So he says to Moses, hold up a stick. That was it. Hold up a stick. And he chooses to be obedient and God parts the Red Sea because of that. That's pretty incredible. God wanted to feed 5,000 people. So he says to, to his disciples, go and get food so he could feed these people. And they questioned and they wondered, but they went and got a boy's lunch and brought it back. And Jesus uses that to feed 5,000 people. God wanted the walls of Jericho to fall down. So he says, walk around the walls and blow a trumpet. Really? You want me to walk around the wall and blow a trumpet? That just kind of sounds kind of like odd. And that's the response a lot of people have toward obedience, toward doing what God says. God says, do this, and people have a, I don't know. You know, I think there's a better way. And the fascinating thing to me is that God uses really simple language. Hold up a stick. Jesus says, go, go wash in the pool. Go get us some food. Walk around the, the walls and blow a trumpet. Another little thing is, do you think it was the trumpets that made the walls fall down? No, it was their act of obedience followed by God's act of taking action on their obedience. You guys did what I said. I'm going to do what I said in that. God has something that he wants to have happen in your life. I honestly believe that. I, I could look at every one of you in the eyes and say, God has something he wants to have happen in your life. And I think that's true. And that will happen as you are obedient to what the Bible says. You take action on obedience and God takes action on blessing you because of your obedience. It's about doing what Jesus says. Now, you might be thinking it's not going to work. It's not going to happen in my situation. My situation is different. My circumstance is different. It's probably not going to work out that way for me. And yet, Jesus, with this man, he says, go wash in the pool. No other explanation was needed. Jesus told him to do it, and he acted in obedience. Third thing to do. In the midst of doing this, there's usually something that happens to all of us in our situations, in our circumstance, especially in our brokenness. And the thing is discouragement. It happens and you get discouraged. So what you need to do is look past the discouragement. You have to look past it. This man is obedient to what Jesus told him to do, and he's healed. He goes back and he encounters all of those people in the village that he had seen all of his life. They had always seen him begging. They saw him as a blind man. He heard their voices. And now for the first time, he sees their faces and they are shocked. It's, it's, it's quite fascinating. They pointed at him and said, that can't be the guy. This is a different guy. He just looks like the guy. That would be pretty discouraging. If you had been blind your whole life and now you can see and they're saying, yeah, that's not you. It doesn't happen that way. So look at what happens. We have the people, the Jewish leaders, and the man himself. The people. Some said, he is the one, but others said, no, he only looks like him. Instead of rejoicing that this blind man could now see, they're looking for someone to blame. They're looking for some way out. They're looking to, to try to convince the others that, no, that cannot happen. And in the midst of this, you know, we're going to get to the man, but the, one of the things that he says that I find so cool, he basically says, hey, wait, no, I am the man. Somebody says, no, you're not. Yes, I am. I'm the guy. But they didn't believe him. See, that's when disappointment and discouragement can come at you like a wave. 
And so you need to look past the discouragement to the truth. You look past the discouragement to God. They wrestled. They wrestled with their life struggle. One of the things people do is when you change, they question your change. Maybe you committed your life to Christ and you're moving forward in the Christian life and somebody questions it and says, you know, it's not really real. That could be discouraging. And so you have to look past the discouragement at the truth that you know. And one of the reasons why people have a hard time with you changing is because they haven't changed. They feel like, hey, I can't change, you can't change. And I don't buy your change. It'll wear off, it'll go away, it won't last. And you just have to look past the discouragement. The Jewish leaders, they had their take on it. The Jewish leaders wouldn't believe he had been blind. The guy's been blind his entire life. And now they're stepping up and saying, no, this miracle can't happen. Obviously, he's not the guy. He couldn't have been healed. They argued with the man that this had not happened. They brought him in and they said, tell us that Jesus is a sinner because he couldn't have done this. So everybody's taking their different angle of approach on the situation. These Spiritual leaders, Jewish leaders, they were spiritually blind because they were stuck. They were stuck in their ways of seeing things, and they were stuck in their disbelief that God could do something amazing. They were stuck. And not only were they stuck, they were mad. They were mad that Jesus healed this guy on the Sabbath. You don't do that on the Sabbath. They had some weird laws at the time. For example, on the Sabbath, if you're out for a walk and you spit, you have to spit on a rock. Because if you spit on a rock, it's not considered work. And you couldn't work on the Sabbath. But if you spit on the ground... That's a part of the process of making clay. So that involves work. So it was against the law to spit on the ground because you can't work on the Sabbath. It, it, it's just fascinating the things that people will think and that they will do and that they will justify. And then in the midst of it, we have to deal with the discouragement that comes at us. And do, you know what I mean? You're moving forward and one little word of discouragement from someone and you're crushed. It just feels like you're just like, why am I doing this? One little setback in my life and I don't have the faith to move forward. It's amazing how many little things will keep us from having real faith in a real God, in a great God. So what we need to do Whenever you're facing any kind of a situation, ask the right questions. Take steps of obedience on the truth that you discover. Look past the discouragement that's going to come. And that's what this man did. You know, I, I love his answer to everyone. One thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. I love that. You guys think what you want to think. You guys say what you want to say. But one thing I know, I was blind and now I see. There's a, a, a song that is sung a lot in church called Amazing Grace. There's a phrase in the song, I once was blind, but now I see. The man who wrote it was a man named John Newton, who was facing some tremendous personal struggles of faith. And he comes to this point where he really does encounter God and God touches him in such a way that his spiritual blindness was removed. And so he writes this song, I once was blind. He was never spirit, uh, physically blind. He's talking about his spiritual blindness. I once was blind, but now I see. And that's what this man is saying. Yeah, I was blind, but now I see. We need to do these things. 
Ask the right questions. Take steps of obedience. Look past the discouragement to the truth. And then there's a fourth thing that we need to do. The fourth thing is to put your trust in Jesus. That's where our trust goes. We put our faith, our trust in Jesus. We live in a real world with real struggles, with real difficulties, and those things really do challenge our faith. But along with living in a real world with real struggles, there is a real God. He's not just a concept. He's not a principle. He is a reality. So when you put your faith in God, your faith becomes different than faith. There is faith. You can have a lot of faith. People, All kinds of people can have faith. But that faith is completely different if it is faith in God. Trusting in Jesus with your life is about faith in God. This man that we're talking about, this man that Jesus healed in John chapter 9, he was blind not because of his sin, not because of his parents' sin. Jesus says he was blind so that in this moment the power of God could be seen. That's what happened. The power of God was seen by a blind man. And everybody else around it had a struggle, had a conflict, had an issue, had a concern. Jesus asked the man if he believes, and his answer was, yes, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped Jesus. What Jesus was doing was not just healing this man's physical blindness. He was healing his spiritual blindness. We have experienced things in life where we feel broken, where we feel hurt or damaged, and we need to trust Jesus with our lives. We need to go to him and worship him and seek him out and let him help us and heal us, not just of the, whatever the physical thing is that we've experienced, but of our spiritual life. We need to be restored. This man worships Jesus. He worships him as the Son of God, as the Messiah, as the Chosen One. Then Jesus told him, in verse 39, I have come into the world to give sight to those who are spiritually blind. And he's using this man and healing this man so that we could see how that works. Jesus heals physical blindness, and he also heals spiritual blindness. In uh, John chapter 12, Jesus said, I have come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the darkness. That's what Jesus wants to do. He wants to shine light into your darkness. He wants to shine light and he wants to restore you. He shines the light. He reveals the truth. And then your choice is, how are you going to respond? Are you just going to pass it off as, yeah, that was really cool? Or are you going to take the moment and worship Jesus? Be obedient to what he said. Because how you respond determines whether you experience life or not. How you respond determines what happens next in your life. And so the right choice is to honor God, to be obedient to God, to bless God, to choose to follow him, and in that, experience life and healing and restoration. So to deal with the hard situations that we face in life, Four things to remember. Ask the right questions. Take the steps of obedience based on that truth that you discover. Look past the discouragement and put your trust in Jesus. It really does require all four of those. But the main one is the fourth one. Put your trust in Jesus. 
if you have some area of life that you would love to see restored, made new, this is how you go about it. You put your trust in Jesus. You let him help you. You let him heal you. I'd like to pray with you right now. Father, I love who you are. I love how you, how you encounter us. I love how you meet us. I pray that each one of us in this room that have heard this truth, I pray that we would respond to your encounter with us in such a way that, that you are blessed, that we are obedient, that we put our trust in you. And from that, I pray that we would experience life. I pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen.